Happy Sunshine family. We are going to take a look today at the United States of America Corporation's response to the dismissal motion that Heather Antucci Giraffe and Randall Keith Bean filed. This response was filed in the court systems in Knoxville, Tennessee on October 12th, 2017. All right. Let me switch over to an easier window for myself. All right. Oh, you know what? And we need to do one other thing. That should allow me to get my purple pointer. All right. So the United States District Court, Eastern District of Tennessee at Knoxville, United States of America v. Randall Keith Bean and Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe, case number 3-17-CR-82, Judges Varlin and Shirley. United States of America's response to the defendant's motion to dismiss. The United States of America by and through Nancy Stollard Har. The United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Tennessee hereby responds in opposition to the defendant's motion to dismiss document number 43 filed by the defendant Heather Antucci Giraffe on October 2, 2017 and joined by co-defendant Randall Bean document 44. The defendants argue that the indictment should be dismissed because this court lacks jurisdiction. For the reasons set forth below, the United States submits the defendant's motion is frivolous and should be denied. Procedural History On July 18, 2017, a grand jury sitting in the Eastern District of Tennessee returned an indictment charging Bean with five counts of wire fraud in violation of uh, Title 18 U.S.C., Sections 1343 and one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering in violation of Title 18 U.S.C. Section 1956, subsection H. Tucci Giraffe was charged with conspiring with Bean to launder money in violation of Title 18 U.S.C. Section 1956, subsection H. H excuse me. And document number three, the indictment. The court held Bean's initial appearance on July 27, 2017. And in parentheses, document nine, minute entry for initial appearance. Bean was detained pending trial. Document 13, the order of detention. On July 26, 2017, Tucci Giraffe was arrested in Washington, D.C., See U.S. v. Tucci Giraffe, case number 17-531, dated Washington, D.C., or D.D.C., I don't know what D.D.C. means, August 2nd, 2017. At Tucci Giraffe's preliminary hearing in that district, she requested an identity hearing, C.I.D., in connection with that hearing, Tucci Giraffe submitted over 150 pages of uniform commercial code financing statements and documents purporting to be from the One People's Public Trust, case number 17-531, R2, Identity Hearing Materials. The court there found that the defendant, Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe, that was before the court is named Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe in the indictment. Tucci Giraffe was then brought to the Eastern District of Tennessee. And then see the commitment to Eastern Tennessee document. On August 29, 2017, the court held hearings for each of the defendants regarding Tucci Giraffe's detention and Bean's representation. Documents 40, or excuse me, 34 through 36. At each of the defendant's hearings, the defendants objected to the court's jurisdiction. Tucci Giraffe and Bean are representing themselves in this action and have standby counsel appointed. And in parentheses, list more documents. Tucci Giraffe filed the instant motion to dismiss on September 29, 2017, which Bean joined. 
the argument. Defendants appear to argue that the court lacks both in personam and subject matter jurisdiction on grounds related to dozens of pages of UCC filings that have no apparent relation or relevance to the case at bar. Defendants claim that the U.S. is a corporation pursuant to 28 U.S.C. section 3002 subsection 15 and in 2012, comma, somehow, comma, the United States, comma, as a corporation, comma, was, quote, foreclosed and terminated, ellipsis, for due cause, end quote. And then it lists the document uh, to go look at that. Accordingly, the United States and the court and its agents, quote, do not legally exist, have authority to act or jurisdiction, end quote, over the action or over the defendants. The defendants' arguments, however, have no legal merit. It, it this is very interesting, the, the arguments here. We, we expected something like this so far. Um, I want to point out that these UCC documents, the 150 pages here of Uniform Commercial Code Financing Statements, uh, a retired police lieutenant uh, sent me an email after having read through those and feels that these documents blow the lid off of this case. And I have a feeling that this foreclosed and terminated for due cause and that these courts and the agents do not legally exist and have no authority to act or jurisdiction. I feel like that may be true, guys. And that has everything to do and that is related to this case. This court unquestionably has both in personam and subject matter jurisdiction as the court with exclusive jurisdiction over matters involving crimes in the United States and gives support for Title 18 USC sections 3231 and also see U.S. v. Pryor from the Sixth Circuit Court 2016. The finding the district court has both in personam and subject matter jurisdiction over federal criminal cases and finding fringe benefits to the contrary meritless. Subject matter jurisdiction over criminal prosecutions is conferred by 18 U.S.C. sections 3231, which states that, quote, the district courts of the United States shall have original jurisdiction exclusive of the courts of the states of all offenses against the laws of the United States, Title 18 U.S.C. 3231, and also see the U.S.A. v. Prior case. The finding the district court has both in personam and subject matter jurisdiction over federal criminal cases and finding fringe beliefs to the contrary meritless. The U.S. v. Balastros from the Fourth Circuit in 2015, holding that because the defendant was, quote, unquestionably subject to the court's authority under Title 18 U.S.C. 3231, his jurisdictional challenge lacks merit. It is undeniable that the defendants have been charged with crimes against the United States. Bean has been charged with wire fraud and money laundering offenses, while Tucci Giraffe has been charged with one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering. These offenses are codified in Title 18, and there is no dispute that they are federal offenses. Accordingly, the court has subject matter jurisdiction over this matter. Any argument to the contrary is meritless. The court must also find that it has in personam jurisdiction over the defendants, this is also indisputable in this case. The defendant's argument that the United States is a, quote, foreclosed, end quote, corporation, or the defendant's claim status as original, quote, original factualized trust, end quote, have no legal relevance to the issue of jurisdiction. 
These claims are similar to arguments advanced by, quote, sovereign citizens, end quote, who argue that they are not subject to the laws or courts of the United States because of some special classification. See United States v. Davis from the Seventh Circuit Court 2013, finding that the argument that district court lacks subject matter jurisdiction reflects, quote, sovereign citizen, end quote, beliefs and is frivolous. Attacks on federal court's jurisdiction in this context are not uncommon. See the U.S. v. Benabi from the Seventh Circuit, 2011. U.S. v. Burke from the Seventh Circuit, 2005. U.S. v. Hilgeford from the Seventh Circuit, 1993. Rejecting, quote, shop warren, end quote, argument, that the defendant is a sovereign and somehow beyond the jurisdiction of the court. Finding, quote, sovereign citizen, end quote, defense has, quote, no conceivable validity in American law, end quote. Courts have routinely rejected such attempts to avoid federal jurisdiction. In Banabi, the defendants raised a number of arguments alleging that they were beyond the court's jurisdiction because they declared themselves to be sovereign citizens, secured party creditors, and, quote, flesh and blood human beings, end quote. The Seventh Circuit roundly rejected such arguments, explaining that, quote, regardless of an individual's claim status of descent, be it as a sovereign citizen, a secured party creditor, or a flesh and blood human being, that person is not beyond the jurisdiction of the courts. These theories should be rejected summarily. Ellipsis, end quote. That's from the Banabi case. Indeed, courts have uniformly rejected arguments that a defendant is sovereign and beyond jurisdiction of the courts. Citing U.S. v. Burke, from the Seventh Circuit, 2005, U.S. v. Hilgeford, Seventh Circuit, 1993, U.S. v. Sloan, from the Seventh Circuit, 1991, and the U.S. v. Schneider, from the Seventh Circuit, 1990, rejecting the defendant's, quote, sovereign citizen, end quote, defense as having, quote, no conceivable validity in American law, end quote. U.S. v. Phillips, from the Seventh Circuit, 2009, Dismissing jurisdiction arguments as frivolous because federal courts have subject matter and personal jurisdiction over defendants brought before them on federal indictments alleging violations of federal law. Finding that, quote, federal courts have jurisdiction over criminal defendants before them whether or not they are forcibly brought into court, end quote. And that's from the U.S. v. Alvarez Machain, 1992, and Frisbee v. Collins, 1952. Likewise, this court should reject the defendant's theory that they are beyond the jurisdiction of the court. That's an interesting word that they put in there, this theory. Uh, they have a claim. It's not a theory. They have made a claim, and you have to address that. And, and they're relabeling it a theory. Here, defendants were charged with violating the laws of the United States. Moreover, despite the indecipherable arguments that the United States is a foreclosed corporation without authority or that the defendants are trusts or some other entity, the court cannot be deprived of jurisdiction. Simply, the defendants are subject to federal laws just like everyone else, regardless of their claim status. This is interesting here. We're going to get into these UCC filings and we're going to find out how indecipherable they really are. I've got a retired police lieutenant who emailed me, who has already been through them, and feels that they blow the lid off of this case. So I'm excited to get into the UCC filings and take a look. So, of course, the conclusion... For the foregoing reasons, the defendant's motion to dismiss should be denied. Signed by Nancy Stollard Har, the U.S. attorney. And, well, it's actually not signed by her. It's signed by Anne Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson, the assistant U.S. attorneys, but they're signing for Nancy Stollard Har. 
Certificate of Service, I hereby certify that on October 12th, 2017, a copy of the foregoing was filed electronically. Notice of this filing will be sent by operation of the court's electronic filing system to all parties indicated on the electronic filing receipt. All other parties will be served by regular U.S. mail. Parties may access this, access this filing through the court's electronic filing system. Anne-Marie Svalto. While Anne-Marie is going... Uh, going in a pretty black and white type of argument here, just citing a bunch of prior cases where people were citing to be sovereign citizens or other cases where people claim the courts had a lack of jurisdiction and where amazingly, not surpri <laughs> very unsurprisingly, that the courts decided, no, we do have jurisdiction. So... What, what this sentence here, moreover, despite the indecipherable arguments that the United States is a foreclosed corporation without authority or that the defendants are trusts or some other entity, the court cannot be deprived of jurisdiction simply. The defendants are subject to federal laws just like everyone else, regardless of their claim status. What it looks like is whoever wrote this, and I'm going to pin this on Anne-Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson because their names are at the end of it. They say that the arguments are indecipherable. I feel like every one of my subscribers has a decent idea what Heather and Randy's arguments are. They are not indecipherable at all. The fact that Anne-Marie Svalto in an official court document is referring to them as indecipherable means that she does not understand them. So right here, she admits in this sentence, we're on page five. It's the very last sentence prior to the conclusion section. She admits that she does not understand their arguments. The arguments are based on UCC law. Claims have been made against the United States Corporation and a whole slew of other entities and persons and families within that related power structure. And these claims have gone unrebutted. They are truth in the eyes of the UCC court. And surely Anne-Marie Sfalto if she's not brushed up on UCC law, would, I'm sure, have some contact somewhere so that the arguments would be decipherable. You cannot rebut or respond to arguments that you don't understand, Anne-Marie Svalto. You haven't mentioned anything about UCC law. You need to do your homework, Anne-Marie Svalto, and so do you, Cynthia Davidson. To take 150 pages of court filings, the same 150 pages which Judge Clifford Shirley admonished Heather, do not file these again, and I, I puzzled why. What does that actually hurt? Well... They want to label all of those as indecipherable arguments, basically enigmas, anathema to any logical understanding. And I sure hope I use that word anathema right. I'll have to look that up later, but I'm going to leave it in and fly with it here. So... <laughs> What I see from this document here is that Anne-Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson are saying, here's a whole slew of cases where the courts have decided that they themselves do have jurisdiction over people, and we don't understand 
Heather and Randy's arguments at all. They are indecipherable, and therefore the motion to dismiss should be denied. And we're not going to peek behind uh, the curtain of UCC law and the actual paperwork that was filed. We're just going to label it indecipherable arguments. So let's head on over to IUV website here. And I need to transition over. All right. So BZ's added some comments. She wants to know what people's thoughts uh, on this response to the motion as expected for them to respond, question mark. I, I think so. And, and it's, it is so, this is presented as so black and white as, uh, as an afterthought, like, wow, are we really even going to look into this UCC filing paperwork at all and see if there's any merit to it? The idea of it seems preposterous. So let's call it indecipherable. Recommend deny motion to dismiss. Um, it, they are refusing to do their work. They are basically claiming that they don't understand it. So let's take a look here. There's a comment from Paul Francis McDonald. I'm not aware of any sworn declaration of Anne-Marie Svalto verifying her authority and or jurisdiction over Heather and Randy specifically. To be honest, I expected something like that a while back. They have to throw in something to save face in their jobs, maybe. Probably. It's weak as an argument because she admits she is not competent in relation to the UCC filings and any authorities or opinions she cites are not specific to the issue at hand, but are entirely general. But anyway, the precipe, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, supersedes that filing. Who is there to deny that precipe to be made a rule of law? Nobody is my guess, other than if they attempt to presume some authority which simply cannot stand up. It's a mathematical certainty. Now, I'm not sure who this comment is coming from, what their background is. Uh, we're in the free dictionary here. Precipe. It's from the Latin, it's given order, an original writ, one of the forms of legal process used to commence an action. A precipe was drawn up in the alternative and commanded the defendant to do what was ordered or to appear and show why he or she had not done it. An order that commands the clerk of court to issue a formal writ of execution directing the enforcement of a judgment already rendered and commanding a public officer to seize the defendant's property in order to satisfy debt. So this big word here, precipe, well, it's really not a big word, it's just a new word that Paul Francis MacDonald uses. Uh, the UCC filings are the order, the judgment that's already been rendered, and the precipe... Uh, is an order that commands the clerk of a court to issue a formal writ of execution directing the enforcement of a judgment already rendered and commanding a public officer to seize the defendant's property in order to satisfy the debt. And in this case, the defendant is the United States Corporation and all the courts that come off of it. So, the precipe is really, as used here, the precipe is, hey, enforce the judgment that Heather has through the UCC courts. The precipe supersedes the filing, and who is there to deny that precipe be made a rule of law? Nobody is my guess. Like, which one of these people that are involved on the prosecution side is going to stand up and deny that 
principe not be made a rule of law. So that's how I decode this. And there, there's quite a few comments here, so we're just going to get through them. Uh, Paul Francis McDonald again. Looks like poor old Anne Marie was made to carry the can by others who knew better or thought they did. There is no dispute as to the declaration of facts. So, it must be true then, and if it is true, then the U.S. is a foreclosed entity and all its tangible assets and systems are claimed as full title rights and ownership thereof and, quote, (laughs) replevened, end quote. Let's look that word up, replevened. Isn't this fun? We get to learn all these new words here. Replevened, an action to recover personal property said or claimed to be unlawfully taken. The writ or procedure of such an action. All right. Well, it seems to me that Paul Francis McDonald has a legal background or some legal understanding. There's the other aspect of it, aside from all of that, what's going on behind the scenes? That's the multi-gazillion dollar question. Comment from Taryn. Thing is, it wasn't a motion, it was a precipe. Oh, interesting, interesting. Okay, so it's really not a defendant's motion. They're not moving to dismiss the case. It's a precipe. That's different. It's a it's an order to enforce a judgment that's already been rendered. That's what they're doing here. And that's obvious that Anne-Marie Svalto and Cynthia Davidson, who wrote this document, don't understand it. And they admit as much because they say it's indecipherable. Uh, somebody named Angel Voice. Could someone please summarize the, de- the motion to dismiss, please? I'm in my car with not enough internet to read. Okay, well, if you know who Angel Voice is, you can tell them about this video. Paul Francis McDonald. It's actually a precipe, which is a command from the only one with authority to do so in the confirmed absence of any other authority. Grounded as it is on 10 maxims of law and the declaration of facts, commanding the clerk of court to issue the orders and adjust the record as required in the precipe, and also commanding any judge to issue and enter a dismissal with prejudice and releasing all defendants from detainment. See above for description of precipe and the history of the original writs. Wow, this is really interesting. I'm going to adjust my microphone here. It needs to come up just a tad. All right. Okay, Reuben Emanuel of the Bailey family says the, quote, U.S., end quote, response is that what was advanced in the precipe is, quote, frivolous and uh, without legal merit, end quote. Not exactly surprising given that they were told they do not legally exist. Paul Francis McDonald says, relying entirely as they do on assumption, presumption, and therefore necessarily hearsay. Ruben Emanuel says it puts their whole, quote, modus operandi, end quote, on blatant display. Modus operandi means method of operation, manner of operation. Hey, what's their standard behavior? What's in their playbook? That's their modus operandi. Paul Francis agrees. Yes, absolutely. Arthur K. Well played in love. Paul Francis, we're on a roll. Taryn says, it wasn't the senior prosecution that put her name on the reply. She seems to have recognized what it was and fobbed it off to the junior prosecutor who does not seem to know the difference between a precipe and a motion. For a motion to even exist, there must be jurisdiction, and no such proof of jurisdiction was provided. 
Uh, Taryn replies, kind of reminds me of a discussion that occurred between some Brits and Americans in Wiltshire in 1989. The Brit, quote, our constitution is superior to yours because it's unwritten, end quote, in the American. You have no constitution because by definition a constitution is in writing, end quote. And then a Brit, when he realizes the truth, uh, okay, it's a little funny emoticon. Use of presumption on the populace is widespread. That's from Taryn. Arthur K. Prestumere. To take in advance of, to take, to be true without positive proof, but upon the basis of probability. To one. Rebume. I'm not, looks like there was a, a typo or cut, copy, paste that got messed up. Supposition, assumption, presumption. All things are inferred against one who destroys or withholds documentary evidence. The principle is that there is a disposition in the courts to uphold official, judicial, and other acts rather than to render them inoperative. Where then there is general evidence of acts having been legally and regularly done, proof of circumstances essential to the validity of those acts, and by which are accompanied in most instances, will be dispensed with. The law presumes that every man in his private and official character does his duty until the contrary is proved that all things are done rightly unless the circumstances of the case overturn this presumption. Thus, it presumes that a man acting in a public office has been rightly appointed, that entries in public books were made by the proper officer, that upon proof of title, matters collateral thereto are consistent and regular. The superior court of general jurisdiction proceeding within the general scope of its powers is presumed to act rightly. All intendments of law are in favor of its acts. It is presumed to have jurisdiction of the cause or subject matter of the action and of the parties. The former will generally appear from the character of the judgment and will be determined by the law creating the court or prescribing its general powers. The latter should regularly appear by evidence in the record of service of process upon the defendant or his appearance in the action. But where the former exists, the latter will be presumed. The rule is different with respect to courts of special and limited authority. There is no presumption of law in favor of their jurisdiction. That must affirmatively appear by sufficient evidence or proper averment in the record or, the, or their judgments will be deemed void on their face. All right, there's not too much more here. Presumptions as to the judgments of superior court only arise with respect to jurisdictional facts concerning which the record is silent. Presumptions are only indulged to supply the absence of evidence or averments respecting the facts presumed. They have no place for consideration when the evidence is disclosed or the averment is made. We need to look up averment. Let's look up that word. Averment, to affirm positively or to declare, to assert formally as a fact in law. <clears throat> when, therefore, the record states the evidence or makes an averment with reference to a jurisdictional fact, it will be understood to speak the truth on that point, and it will... Riot, hmm, I think this is a typo, I think it means not, I think the R-I should be a, the letter N, will not be presumed that there was other or different evidence, <clears throat> or that, <coughs> uh, 
uh, or that the fact was otherwise than as averred. Were this not, were this not, so it would never be possible to attack collaterally the judgment of a superior court, although a want of jurisdiction might be apparent upon its face. The answer to the attack would always be that, notwithstanding the evidence or the averment, the necessary fact to support the judgment are presumed. These presumptions are also limited to jurisdiction over persons within the territorial limits of the courts, persons who can be reached by their process, and also over proceedings which are in accordance with the course of common laws. Well, that was a bunch of extra from, let's see, that was from Arthur K. Uh, I'm not, I'm not quite sure just how much those comments have to do uh, with applicability in this case, but we are making observations and watching this all unfold in real time, and we're really interested in if the courts are going to deny their own eyes, their own senses, their own documents, or the UCC documents, deny court documents and ignore them, or are the people going to hit enough thumbs up on this video so that the system knows that we're watching them and that they better go look at these court documents All right. <clears throat> so that was the USA's response to the dismissal motion. And, and there's, there's some question of whether or not it's a price of pay or a dismissal motion. It seems like a price of pay uh, when we read through the comments on the IUV website. If you've got any love lighter links for me, please send them to lunacy at protonmail.com. Please hold a high vibration for all of those souls and subscribers that are in Ireland. I've got one that I know of, David. He emails me frequently. And uh, you know what? Let me just let me just pull up his last email on my phone here. And I will tell you what he says is going on in Ireland right now. Okay, he says the east coast of Ireland, winds 65 kilometers now, light rain, most of the houses here are made of mass concrete. The west coast usually gets the worst from the Atlantic. Um, And that was from 11.08 today, earlier from 5 o'clock in the morning local time, uh, they had 45 kilometers kilometer hour winds all the buses and trains have stopped most people have been given the day off to go home Uh, the west coast will be hit the hardest people are saying pray anyways he's going to keep me in touch and let me know what happens so david stay safe and keep your observations rolling in. They're very important. There's a lot of questions about whether or not this is a real hurricane. Uh, The Truth Channel had some amazing things to talk about uh, with, you know, more of the same shady business, not finding it on reflective radar. So we keep shining light where we see the observations that root us in knowing. And that's where healthy perceptions get their start. I love you guys so much. Peace out. Bye-bye.